Hey guys, how's it going? Matt here uh, with another episode of Nuance. For those of you that don't know, my name's Matt and I'm living in China. I'm south of Shanghai by a couple of hours in a city called Ningbo. And uh, I'm trying to tell stories of my life here in China, honestly and objectively, to try to give you guys a little bit of uh, cannon fodder to uh, adjust your opinions of the world and uh, hopefully add some nuance to your ideas and thoughts of things. Uh, I hope you're having a good weekend if you're watching this uh, on the day I record it. And uh, today I, I thought I'd talk about something from my apartment. <laughs> I'm not on the street or anything. I'm not in my little studio. I thought I'd do something a little bit off the cuff. Um, because, you know, part of uh, understanding the world is understanding how much it's changed. And I had a bunch of topics listed on my phone and I found one that I could probably do in the, in the apartment. There's a bunch of other ones that I want, but they require a couple of uh, extra uh, fun little frills that you'll see in the future. But for now, I wanted to talk about things that I used to really hate about China, but I don't anymore. And the reason I don't anymore is, is, is varied, but the bottom line is that China has changed and, and so the things that really frustrated me don't frustrate me anymore because they're either m much less or they don't exist. So hopefully you can understand how China has changed and maybe think about how the world has changed and maybe you can have a little bit more of an objective opinion of this country and maybe other countries. Number one, we'll just stick light, ice, cold, cold beverages. <laughs> when I first came to China, um, in 2005, um, I, <laughs> I tried to get myself a glass of water. And in America, I normally carry around a big old jug of water. Um, and I'm always drinking ice, ice water. I mean, you'd fill up the cup 100% with ice, you'd add enough water, and that thing will get you through the day with a nice ice cold uh, beverage. Um, of course, ice cold beer, pretty much everything in the West, at least in America, it's always better when it's ice cold. I came to China and I just asked for water. And when that water came out, it was, it wasn't even warm, it was hot. Just hot water. They're like, we got hot tea, hot water, warm beer. Take your pick. And I remember thinking, that is just so odd that uh, they just, you know, I said, could you add some ice? Jia Bing, <laughs> Bing, Bing Kwai is, is ice. It's like, Jia Bing, add some ice. And they looked at me like, you don't want that ice. That's the ice we use to put on the meats and the, and the, and the, and the stuff that we keep in the fridge um, in, the, in the restaurant. Like, you don't want us to put that ice in your beverage, trust us. Um, most of the ice they use wasn't on a purified system and so it wasn't even drinkable in most cases. And I remember it always bothered me. It was always something that I was like, can't you guys put ice in anything? I like cold stuff. They, and the, the Chinese have a whole philosophy around cold beverages. The cold stuff is not good for you. You drink cold stuff and it can affect your system. It's, it's certainly not good. Even if you have a like high, high fever, they're like, you gotta sweat that fever out even more than you're sweating. They'll give you hot water, take a hot bath. In America, you drink cool beverages, you take a cold bath. Now, over the course of uh, over 10 years in China, that has changed quite a bit. You go to the bars, you can get a cold beer. You don't even have to like worry about it. You go to most restaurants, you get cold water. A lot of them, a lot of them still do the wen shui. Wen shui is like warm water. But most of the time, I would have to say, it's not hard to have them understand that, that you want cold water. Um, and that's pretty cool, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Um, I can get a cold beer. Cold beer culture is, is here now uh, and, and it's understood that if you want a beer, you can get it pretty cold. There's still people out there that drink warm beer, drink warm water and everything, but uh, it's not a, an overbearing problem that I'm like, ugh, I'm gonna have to try to bend some, some logic here to get somebody to get me an ice, iced beverage. If you watch my last episode, you'll, you'll know that uh, the pollution in China has improved quite a bit, especially over the last probably four or five years, even more in the last two years, even before the pandemic, there was a, a big initiative to reduce the amount of pollution coming out of factories 
and to encourage uh, clean air uh, policies. Beijing has seen a big improvement. Shenzhen has seen a big improvement. Many cities have adopted this green energy and green living uh, initiative, and it is evident. Um, it used to be in, in Ningbo, I used to have an app, and it, really just recently, like a couple of years ago, a AQI app, you'd look at the AQI and air quality, what is air quality I, AQI? Anyways, you'd look at the air quality level and you'd say, I can't do that run outside. Oh, I can't, I can't play outside. The, the, the outdoor activities are going to have to take a side seat, tie it side seat to my health and uh, my overall health. And that was really, really frustrating. That was always something that was really, really hard to deal with. It was something I hated about China. I like a lot of things. I love a lot of things living here. But uh, having the outside so polluted that you wouldn't even want to go outside uh, or spend time outside was really, really frustrating. Today, man, it's been amazing. Um, air is clean. I've traveled a lot. I've been all over China, so I've seen a lot of different places inside the interior of China, on the coast of China, and I've done that now and in the past, so I've had the ability to see the improvement on, in a vast swath of area around China. And uh, I gotta say that the improvement in, in environmental policies, the improvement in, in uh, the quality control of, of, uh, of polluting factories has improved considerably. Do we still get those days in China? 100%. But it's gone from a, oh, I hate this about China, to, you know what, it's, it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality I gotta deal with every so often. And that's, I'll, I'll take that out of the hate category and put it into, into another category completely. It's not, it's not something I hate about China anymore. I've seen a vast improvement in the personal behavior of the Chinese citizens over the last more than a decade. There has been a huge movement uh, assisted by the government to try to get people to understand uh, the nuance in, in just uh, being a better citizen. Um, spitting in public is, is, is much, much reduced. Uh, people peeing on the side of the road, which which still happens, you still see it. I've, I remember seeing it in the States, especially on long road trips, you'll see people stopping and peeing on the side of the road. It still happens. I've peed on the side of the road. Oh, jeez, I've, I've, I've cycle toured around a lot of this world and, and, and many times you just stop and do your thing. But it was, it was really, really obvious uh, 10 years ago. Um, and they'd even go number two. They'd be pooping in the streets, you know? So you'd see a, you'd see a little pile of poop and you'd be like, is that people poop? Or is that like animal poop? I mean, <laughs> you have to ask that question. When you gotta ask that question, you're running into an interesting problem. Um, spitting and smoking. Smoking in China is still very, very popular, but it's much less popular. Um, I remember a funny story. I remember when I first moved to China 10 years ago, I had a little apartment, 30 square meters, very, very small apartment, probably the size of most people's closets. I moved into an area of Ningbo called Haishu, and uh, I had a little shitty apartment and in a fairly rundown area. Um, today, that area, just to kind of give you an idea, things have improved. My apartment used to be alongside a fairly major major artery into Ningbo from from the uh, from the west, um, but they built a subway there now. And I was there, living there, right as they started the construction, just before the construction and right during the construction of that subway. Um, today, I just drove past there a few days ago. And I was like, hey, this is my old, my old apartment here, you know? And I looked around, night and day, guys. I mean, it is clean. The, the, the subway system has, has brung opportunity to, for people to live and to, and to um, commute very easily into the center of the city, from the outside of the city. And it is, it is vastly improved. I, I used to hate living, well, you know what? I'm not gonna use that word. I liked living there when I, was, uh, when I was first here. It was actually a really great way to introduce myself to China. Just go kind of into the, kind of the rougher area of town and, and learn about that life. I got, I got my laptop stolen. I mean, there was definitely some, some frustrating things that happened, but overall, I wouldn't trade it because 
I, I lived in an area where not a lot of people spoke English. I had to learn about body language and communicating people beca with people because I didn't speak English very well or Chinese very well when I when I when I mo lived there, and it was it was like being thrown into the deep end. I had to learn about how to how to communicate people with people in a in a new way. And if I would have say moved to a more foreigner area district, um, I wouldn't have been challenged so much. And so I, I, I'm thankful that I actually lived at that part of town. But I, I lived there during the time that it was a bit, a bit slummy. And I used to walk around. I wanted to find a gym. And I ended up finding a gym um, that was down an alleyway. Like, had to go in one alleyway, another alleyway. There was a, like a massage place tied up next to it, which was pretty seedy. And uh, I remember they had a pool. And I'd swim in the pool. And uh, it was kind of a, just a small pool, and these people would be smoking, and their smoke would come over into the pool and like come along the top of the. So when I breathed, I would breathe. <laughs> I was basically smoking and swimming at the same time. They were just doing the smoking, the actual act of smoking for me. Ice water. And so I, uh, <laughs> I ended up. Uh, seeing that gym and it, the, the, I, holy moly there was actually guys that would wear leisure suits you know like a leisure like a like a suit they just didn't wear, didn't wear glasses but they would wear a leisure suit anybody know that reference they'd wear a leisure suit i, I snuck that one in there they would wear a leisure suit and they'd be running on the treadmill smoking a cigarette with dress shoes on they'd be smoking <laughs> it's so crazy it's crazy it was crazy it was crazy but it was kind of like living, like, it was almost like feeling like, wow, this is, this is really weird and interesting place. And I embraced it for its uniqueness. Today, that gym's policy is no smoking. There's no more smoking in, in those sorts of areas. There's no smoking. Uh, in fact, you know, there's still smoking outside of coffee shops. You can smoke. There's no smoking inside. There's a lot of, uh, policies that encourage good behavior, uh, more cohesive society where people don't have to put up with, you know, somebody spitting and pissing and chitting and smoking so close around them. It's, it's not quite as ubiquitous as America where I, I think there's even outdoor smoking is prohibited in certain areas and stuff. Uh, it's not quite there yet. People still smoke, but there's a huge improvement. It's certainly a hundred percent gone from a category of, oh, I kind of hate that to a category of, it's, it's very easy to put up with. It's a, it's a vast, vast social improvement. And that's important to think about. It is a countrywide, we're talking about 1.4 billion people. Um, I mean, obviously you get into the very, very rural places where there's a farmer that's, you know, that's doing his thing every day. He's sitting out in his house, he's smoking. There's no change in his life, really. But once you get into the cities, where the, the higher populated areas, there's a huge turnover in the change of personal grooming, personal behavior of the average Chinese citizen that I've seen. It's certainly gone from hate to, to uh, quaint, I think. It's kind of quaint to see, I don't know, I think it's kind of quaint to see, you know, some of these things, this guy spitting and rarely, you know, like, like you know, I, I don't mind that. My dad was a big spitter. He would, he was a big hawk a kind of guy. And so I don't have any a real aversion to it, but it was so, so common back then that it's kind of nice to see it uh, toned down a little bit. Now, one of the, the, the things that, that has been an interesting change that you can kind of see as a societal improvement and also look into the culture is uh, paper money. Um, I remember holding on to um, like e yen bills. Like we're talking like, the smallest currency uh, of bill and Iba yen, Arshu yen, you know, this is just, just all these RMB notes and man, oh man, especially the lower ones that people used to use to, to, to pay the taxi and things like this. And taxis are a huge improvement too. We'll get to that. But holy moly, paper currency, you know, paper currency new is fairly stiff and then you fold it and then it gets a fold, and then you put it in your pocket, it gets a little crinkly. But the amount of effort that has to go in to a piece of paper currency to turn it into what I have held onto, really gross. I mean, like, was this toilet paper? 
<laughs> was this used as, as toilet paper for somebody? I mean, if you were to take a DNA analysis of what was on some of the bills that I held in my hand, in my pocket, in my jacket, holy moly, what? If this, if you could like tell, if you were like one of those, uh, 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 one of those people, mind readers, you know, and they, you can touch an item. And uh, this is my cat. Hey, you wanna say hi? This cat is so cool. This is Wang Xiao Ai. Everybody say hi. Wang Xiao Ai. Look, look, look. Look up here. Yeah, say hi. You're purring. I can hear you. <laughs> Anyways, if you could do like a, a palm reading, but a, but a bill reading, what a story those bills would have. Holy moly, it was disgusting. Mostly on the EN, but then you'd get up to the, you know, 5 RMB, and, the, and 5 RMB was a nasty, and then 20 RMB, a little bit less. 100 RMB, obviously, those are the bigger notes, um, but they were disgusting, and um, it's much, much less. It's, like, almost non-existent. I haven't had a bill, a paper bill, in my pocket in China. Shit, I can't even remember. We're talking months and months and months that I have needed to pay with something with, with a non-digital form of currency. Today, you have WeChat or Alipay and pst, swipe it, you paid it. It doesn't matter how small it is. And you know what's interesting is this is, oh, there's a, that's actually a, a whole new topic for nuance, I think. What digital currency has allowed Chinese people to do and opportunities to flourish, it's huge. Donating money, you know, Chinese people help each other a lot. There's always like, do you wanna to donate to this cause? Do you wanna help this person? Do you wanna do this? There's people that are selling items on the roadside and normally they'd have to deal with all this paper, but now, like like for example, you'd walk down the road and you'd say, you know what, this person, she, he's making a little craft or something. I'd really like to buy it. I just don't have any cash on me. Now, you never don't have any cash on you. You literally can say, you know what, uh, five RMB, whatever, here we go. Yeah, thanks. And you walk away and that, that fairly poor uh, shopkeeper can take that money. He doesn't have to deal with all the paper currency. He gets that money completely tangible so right away. And uh, you're on your way. You don't got to deal with anything like that. And the transaction makes so easy. I haven't had to touch a bill in so long. This has gone really from a, I hate that about China. It's so gross to, I, I, I literally the currency I have is, is basically new <laughs> actually, because I've never used it. I think I pulled it out of the bank just to have some money on me. I put it in my wallet just in case I have a hundred, 200 RMB, just, just in case. But other than that, I've never had to worry about it. It is pretty, it is pretty awesome. Okay, uh, let's talk about taxis. Um, in China, uh, when I first moved to China, they had uh, Volkswagen Santanas. And I always used to think that was funny because I know the Santana uh, band and I was like, Santana? I'd, I never really saw any of this type of car brand in the Volkswagen in the United States. We have the Passat, we have the Jetta. Uh, but, but the Santana, I never really, the Golf, I remember the Golf, but no Santanas. Somehow they took all of these Santanas from all different points around, around the world, I think, and imported them. And they were, I think they were just taking secondhand Santanas from, from all over the place and like bringing them to China and making them their initial taxi fleet. And there's still some Santanas out there, but I got really used to taking taxis as, as my primary mode of transportation. And holy moly, the smells that would exist inside those cars. Oh my God, stale cigarette. I mean, smoking inside the taxi when you're, when you're sitting there, which still happens from time to time. And I'm, as a caveat, I don't take as many taxis as I used to. I actually have a car and, and I, 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 I don't take taxis as much, but I have taken taxis from the airport to and from certain places. If I know I'm drinking, I'll take a taxi into the, into town because I don't want to worry about, you know, uh, I'm leaving my car because I'm drinking. I, I, I don't want to drink and drive. And so I do take some taxis. And, and I got to tell you, the taxi situation in China has improved considerably. It used to be something that I sort of did not like. I don't know. I don't even know if in this whole video hate is, I don't like that word hate. Um, it's just much, much different. And many people would look at it and say, oh, I hate that shit. I hate riding in those old, disgusting Chinese taxis. That problem 
has been reduced greatly. What do you think? Anybody here in, uh, you can put in your comment section, put in my comments, your comment section, not, not yours, mine. Put it in my comment section. Tell me what, what do you think? Uh, if you're a teacher in China, a lot of teachers, you know, they don't have time to buy a car and stuff. They're living on campus, but they take taxis a lot. Has you, have you seen the taxi situation improve? Let me know. Put it in the comment section below. If you guys know me at all, you know I'm a big coffee guy. And when I moved to China, that was one of the things I sort of had to give up. Um, back 10 more years ago, you could find coffee at like some of the really nice hotels where they knew that foreigners would come to do business. But the coffee shops, there was a place called E-Cafe and there's still a lot of E-Cafes, but the coffee culture didn't exist. So it was like a novelty. You just buy this coffee, and but, but you gotta buy peanut snacks and maybe, maybe some goose tongue or some duck neck and you bring out all these things and then you'd lay out these little coffee cups. They were like a shot glass for a typical American. It was certainly not anything like this. What no venti coffee. And I remember I was around when the first uh, Starbucks opened in Ningbo and it was like the largest Starbucks, I think in China at the time. Um, obviously there've been more, but it was, it was the biggest thing in town. And I remember there was a shift in culture uh, towards coffee culture. And that was a huge development over time. Today, there's a Starbucks in almost every city and in the bigger cities, there's a Starbucks in almost every corner. There's some corners where you can see a Starbucks, a Starbucks, a Starbucks in three different locations in the same intersection right here in Ningbo. And Ningbo is not like a Shanghai or a Shenzhen. It's, it's a step below that, but it's still a fairly bustling city. That's one of those I'm really happy because I was never a huge fan of tea. Although I've had tea grow on me, I like tea a lot more than I used to. Um, I've always been a coffee guy. My dad was a guy that always would take the family out to Dunkin' Donuts and get a coffee with the family. Let me sit in his lap as, he, as he's driving the truck. Let me put my hands on the steering wheel. Going and getting coffee was part of my life. And so um, drinking coffee today is a way for me to touch that, that uh, memory center in my brain and go back to the good old days. Uh, <laughs> here's one that's kind of interesting. Um, now I know tomato is a fruit, but in America it's not used so much as a fruit. In China, way back in the day, it was pretty much a fruit. The way that they dealt with some foods was really odd to me. I wouldn't even put it in a hate category, but it was certainly like a, huh. I'll give you an example, birthday cakes. You'd have whipped cream that wouldn't be as sweet as what we kind of feel like. Now, you know, living in China, you got to accept that there's certain things that are different. So uh, tastes and things, Coca-Cola tastes different here. You know, ice cream frosting used to take, taste a lot different here. There's all sorts of things that used to taste different. But one thing that was really odd to me was their use of tomatoes in lieu of strawberries or in place of strawberries or instead of strawberries. And you would get a birthday cake and it would have all these red things on it and your, your Western psyche would go, oh, cool, that thing's got some strawberries, all right. And then you'd take a scoop, you put it in your mouth, you'd be like, that thing's kind of slippery. That's a tomato. What is a tomato doing on a birthday cake? Come on, guys. What are you doing putting tomatoes on birthday cakes? I mean, granted, it's a cultural thing, but tomatoes on birthday cakes? And the other thing was the use of mayonnaise on watermelons. They would give you a couple watermelons. Oh, really nice watermelons. They do watermelons really good here in China. But then they they slather it all with, with mayonnaise. And, and you're just like, you just ruined some pretty god darn good watermelon with some mayonnaise. What are you doing? Um, today, the mayonnaise over the watermelon can be found. Obviously, these tastes exist in the culture, so you can still find it, but there has been a move towards uh, Western taste buds. Now, I'm just, I'm not saying that there's like a, uh, uh, what is that called, gentrifying of the culture, but there is, a, there has been a move, just like coffee, to some, they've been embraced some Western uh, 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 habits and uh, cultural uh, norms. And one of them is coffee, another is, is the use of tomatoes has is, is, is reduced quite a bit on birthday cakes and, and the slathering of mayonnaise over the uh, uh, watermelon has, has reduced. Every so often I do see it, but it has certainly changed quite a bit from the time I've lived here. Also, if you've seen my episodes before, the, the state of toilets, public toilets, personal toilets has changed immensely. The 
shitty toilets still exist. They still exist. If you go rural China, you'll find some really low quality toilets. They will smell, they will stink. But China has had a toilet revolution with regards to improving that. And um, if you go out and, and want to do your business, first of all, you'll find a place to do your business. I think there's a lot more public toilets available to the public in China than in most Western countries, especially in America. Like if you want to go out and go to the bathroom and you got to find a place to go, most people aren't welcoming to people, strangers coming in and saying, can I, can I use your toilet? Or, you know, I can't, or even finding one public, public usage. Obviously with you're on the main highways or stuff, you're doing, you, you'll have rest areas for toilets, but I'm just talking about normal life. You're driving through a city. It's very difficult to find public toilets in the States. In China, you'll find a lot of public toilets. It used to be most of those toilets were disgusting like so much ammonia smell you wouldn't even walk in there it would be like hitting you in the face and it was really really disgusting squat toilets i have a whole toilet episode you guys can watch that it's not a, it's not as bad as you think the episode is actually quite funny uh, i'll leave a link to it but uh toilet toilets in general have improved vastly i i can do the squat so i actually don't mind the squat toilets um it's actually I think probably more healthy for you. It squeezes the, it's like a ketchup packet, you know, it'll get it out. But um, sitting is also available in most, most uh, public toilets too. So um, the toilet culture, huge improvement. I used to really hate it, to be honest. It was, it was a real fear. I used to fear, oh my God, I have to go to the bathroom. What am I gonna do? Maybe I should just hold it, you know, for like 24 or 48 hours. <laughs> Depending on what I was doing, I mean, maybe maybe I need to hold it for a few days, maybe a week. I think maybe I could do that. But then, but then I found that uh, there was a lot of places available today to do your business and not have to freak out about it. Just the fact of littering used to be that you would see people throwing stuff out the window of their car into the main road all the time. Bugged the hell out of me. I will certainly put it in the hate category. I have a real frustration and anger with how flippant people can be uh, about the world we live in. It's like we have a second earth that we can go to, so we might as well just destroy this one. It was, it was the attitude that I felt existed here in China. And um, I mean, garbage, sometimes I'd see people that would take their garbage bag and they'd just throw it out. Now, there's an interesting garbage culture in China that I would like to do in a future episode. The nuance of what happens to people's garbage here in China is kind of interesting. The way that poor people will take opportunities like collecting uh, cardboard or collecting f uh, uh, styrofoam or plastic and make that into their lifestyle where they will go and they will sift through garbage to pull out things that can be recycled. And what a great thing for that because it gives otherwise homeless potential people an opportunity to have a purpose and they go and do this. Also, it won't be buried in, 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 in a landfill in, in a day. It'll actually be in a place that will exist for the purpose of recycling the glass or the plastic or the, or the metal bottles or the styrofoam. And, um, but, but neither here nor there, I think there was an idea that if I throw my garbage out, there will be a, a swarm of people that will pick through it and take all the good stuff. But the problem is that even the food waste will go to pig farms. I mean, they, they really thoroughly have places for all your component garbage. Um, and But today, the recycle culture is a lot more. As a matter of fact, there are recyclable bins, even places for your batteries. Like there's a like hazardous waste bins and all these kind of things. And I think the, the trickle down effect was that the government put all of these things in place. And they've said, these are for you guys. Use these things wisely. And people in the beginning were like, I don't wanna use it. And just throwing their waste in the big bin. Certainly less of this. But even then, they were just throwing their stuff in the big bin, but they were kind of caring more about their garbage. There was even a, um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody in Shanghai did this? I, I read a story about people getting bags. It was even in Ningbo in a few places. They would get garbage bags with barcodes on them. And the bags would be for certain types of things. And you had to separate your stuff. And when you threw it away, there would be a person by the dumpster, like you had to throw it away a certain time every day, and they would scan it and look in it. And if it wasn't what uh, was supposed to be in that bag, they'd give it back to you and say, you better sort this shit out, <laughs> literally. 
and I'm not sure where that went. Does anybody know about that? Leave it in the comment section below. Is that trash, trash sorting barcode thing still a real thing? If it is, send me a message. I'd like to know a bit more about it because that would be something interesting to talk about in a future episode, especially if I want to do a future episode about garbage management in China. So let me know. I think that would be an interesting episode and I'd like to share it. Certainly, today's idea of of wasting garbage and throwing things out the window is is thoroughly different and thoroughly changed. Um, it still exists. Like I said, I'm always going to put a caveat. This is a huge country and there are some very impoverished areas that haven't changed as fast as the area I live in or the areas that I have visited. But I certainly have been to some of the poorest places in China and even those places I've seen a radical change. Another one, construction and bad roads. China used to have some really, really bad roads. Uh, when I started my cycle tour, I went from Ningbo, 3,000 kilometers, all the way to uh, uh, Guangzhou, and then I got in a car accident and run over by a truck on my way to Guilin. That was probably the longest stretch of road that I rid, road that I rid, road that I rode on my uh, cycling journey. And we had some gravel roads, some broken roads, some shitty roads, some just awful, awful roads. Um, that wasn't the shortest distance. The second, so I did that in 2014, um, and the roads were disgusting. I'm like, it was difficult. It was like trying to cycle through sand or rough rubble. That was what it was like riding a lot of these, even second tier roads. They weren't like the highways. I couldn't ride on the highways, but I rode on the second secondary roads. Now I rode again. Um, in 2018, 2019, I think I was back in China and I was cycling south. I was cycled through some of the poorest areas in, in China, Guangxi province. It was, I was expecting the worst because I had just cycled, you know, years prior. And holy shit, the difference was incredible. The amount of infrastructure that China has, in, uh, the amount of investment that China has put into infrastructure all over China. I'm talking even way up in, in, in Dunhuang, all the way into areas that are remote where very few people live. I was in a valley in Guangxi that the villagers were like in the dozens and they had like white paved roads that went up over mountains into valleys. You could tell that there was a lot of forethought in a lot of these, uh, these infrastructure projects. And that has changed so vastly. Used to be in the, oh my God, I really don't like the infrastructure here in China. Today, it's in the, oh my God, this is awesome. It's really awesome. That's why I really have a frustration with people that say that China hasn't lifted anybody out of poverty or China didn't do this or China didn't do this. Listen, you build roads and it provides a, an opportunity to people. Roads provide opportunity. And there are so many more roads that have been built in a quick way, in a quality way, that uh, it's undeniable that people have been able to lift themselves to a higher level simply because there's a better road into their hometown that connects them to the world. Um, I lived in Detroit. We had like <laughs> two seasons. It was summer and construction. And it seemed like nothing ever, it was just the smallest amount of stuff was improved as opposed to in China, that same amount of time, they'd build roads throughout the entire city. <laughs> in the same time that, that Detroit was working on one section of highway, it seemed like China would just have all of this stuff done. And it's just an amazing evolution. I'd like to do another episode about infrastructure because I think that's been just a huge improvement and something that I could talk about on its own. It's just really, really incredible to see the progress that can be made when you do have, a, have sort of a single party-ish system that says, we are gonna do this. We're going to invest the money and we are going to connect the city with rail. We're going to connect the city with roads. Um, I think there's lessons to be learned in how China got that stuff done. And maybe the systems don't exist in, in America or some places, not the same governmental structure, but you got to look at the proof and the results of it. It's a real amazing experiment. You build the roads. Let's see what happens. Well, China's built the roads. You can see what's happened. Why don't you take that and say, well, maybe we can do some, something like that here in America, but in our own special way. You know, when you look at the differences between what life was like when I first lived here and, and what life is like today, it's so incredible 
to see where the country has gone, to see these little things like drinking cold water and, or, you know, uh, or, or driving culture or, you know, just the, all the little things I talked about and more that have improved in this country. And um, understanding that, understanding where China was, where China is, sometimes it's hard to, to see a country change so drastically. You know, America has hundreds of years that it's been sort of this, this, it's slowly improving. China has done this, wah, huge improvement real quick. They've had time to experiment with things and see results of societal changes, human changes, cultural changes real quick. And then you've seen people adopt things that help and, and, and push things down that didn't help and evolve in a short period of time. It's like a little experiment. And I think that if you can look at that experiment, it really allows you to understand the nuance in, in, in certain uh, aspects of the world, you know? Can we implement this? What are they doing right that what we can do right? What, what are some things that have improved over there? And uh, hopefully what I've been able to do is tell you some of these stories and that you can kind of look at these stories as a, a template for understanding not only how China has improved, but also how maybe you can improve, how the world can improve, how you can implement these things. These things are possible all over the world. And China's got way, way more to this list than I have included here. Why don't you go ahead and leave it in the comment section below. Tell me some of the things that you used to hate about China. If you, if you can, uh, uh, I know a lot of people that watch this video do and have lived in China. So tell me some of the things about your lives that you think when I moved to China or I traveled to China, it was this way. And today it's this way and it's much improved. Um, you can also tell me some things that maybe have gone down. I, I guess you could do a list of things that have uh, in your mind gotten worse. I'm very hard pressed to think of anything. Um, with regards to uh, the, the life in China and the life that you can't have in China. But maybe you can uh, enlighten me, provide me with a little nuance on this topic and uh, leave your comment in the, in, the, in the comment section below. You know, the comment section on nuance, I would like to be its own, um, its own reflection on, uh, on, on the world. So it, it, beyond the videos, I would love to have people uh, talking in the comment section and, and, and helping other people learn about their lives because some of the things I might say might not reflect on your ideas. Uh, I would like to end this episode with a little bit of a caveat in an episode I did uh, a while back about skiing and the cost of skiing. Zach P. Uh, I used his clip where he talked about the average salary in China being, uh, in, in Jilin being 3,000 uh, RMB. He, he called me uh, a couple of days ago and said that he had some um, other statistics that said some different things about uh, an amount of money that was less than that being the average. Um, so I want to, he was a little bit frustrated and thinking that I was kind of calling him out. Um, I was simply finding stats online and those were the stats I found. They were, they were a, a varied uh, range of, of incomes. But I do think that that, um, regardless, irregardless of the average income in Jilin, um, it does not cost 10 or 12,000 RMB to go skiing. I think that was my point. The average person who is making, um, you know, a middle class salary or an upper middle class salary makes up a large portion of people in Jilin. Much, much more than 1% of the population can afford two to 400 RMB if they really want to go and play some winter sports. The point of the video was to try to say that uh, the 1% are not the only people that can afford to go skiing. It was a castigation on the elite nature of, uh, of, of a certain population of people in China and saying that if you weren't 1%, there's no way that you could afford to go skiing. And I was trying to uh, provide some nuance to the fact that, yes, you can go skiing um, if you're not the 1%. And I think that I answered that. Uh, listen, there's a lot of statistical data on income. And if you find alternative data on that, I, I wasn't trying to say that Zach was being a liar. Uh, so please lay off. Nuance is not about 
taking the information I give you and then spewing it in other people's faces. More or less, the information I give you, I hope you put in your mind and it hopes to add some nuance to your perception of things. I'm not looking to provide people with fuel to attack other people. I'm just trying to provide you with some fuel to understand the world as you perceive it. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. Leave a comment in the comment section below. Like, subscribe, share. And uh, yeah, it's been really nice. This channel is, is fantastic. I just got an uh, opportunity to start monetization. So we've hit that milestone. So thank you guys very much. We've got some amazing things planned. I'm really excited. This video has gone super long, but I had fun. Did you have fun? I had fun. Thanks a lot. Hope I've added a little nuance to your life. Have a good one. Great weekend. And we'll talk later. Bye-bye.